C'est-à-dire que j'avoue n'être pas capable de définir la plus forte raison de proposer un modèle de fonctionnement social idéal pour notre société scientifique. Si on dit que, en revanche, il existe une certaine nature urgente, que cette nature humaine n'a pas même tout ce que chose dans la société actuelle, il a l'habitude, et du moins sans l'idée d'une société surréaliste, de considérer que le bien soit il est bloqué. Et si on a un maître, est-ce qu'on ne risque pas s'exercer par un certain nombre de définitions de la nature qui est à la fois l'administration cette nature humaine sa cachée et réprimée qui est présente, est-ce qu'on ne risque pas de réaction, la police, l'armée que nous en faisons toutes ces institutions sont faites pour transmettre à nos hommes les faits de sorte que, et est-ce que la notion de nature et les gens qui n'obéissent pas, vous-même, mais je m'en sens que le pouvoir ne savait pas très bien ce que c'est qu'il s'exerce même encore, il s'exerce en nous, vous savez que nous parlons de nature et 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 de nature
l'influence et la formule de la société future, sans avoir bien fait la critique de tous les rapports politiques qui s'exercent entre les sociétés, on risque de les laisser se reconstituer, même à travers des formes aussi achieve some of the possible goals. And that means that we have to be bold enough to speculate and create social theories on the basis of partial knowledge while remaining very open to the uh, strong possibility of that overwhelming probability that at least in some respects we're very far off the mark. Comme revendication du côté de la classe opprimée et comme justification du côté de la classe oppressive. Et euh, euh, dans, une, dans une société sans classe, je ne suis pas sûr qu'on ait encore à utiliser cette notion de justice. Sketch it out, but some sort of an absolute basis ultimately residing in fundamental human qualities in terms of which we and I work with the International Social Organization, and I just want to start by saying and I think that our existing system of justice, I think it's too hasty to characterize our existing systems of justice as merely systems of class oppression. I don't think that they are that. I think that, they're, that they embody systems of class oppression, and they embody elements of other kinds of oppression, but they also embody Non, mais on ne répond pas au si peu de temps. Je dirais simplement ceci, je ne peux pas m'empêcher, contrairement à ce que vous pensez, je ne peux pas m'empêcher de croire que cette notion de nature humaine, cette notion de bonté, de justice, d'essence humaine, de réalisation de l'essence humaine, tout ça, ce sont des notions et des concepts qui ont été formés à l'intérieur de notre civilisation, dans notre type de savoir dans notre forme de philosophie et que par conséquent ça fait partie même de notre système de classe et qu'on ne peut pas, aussi regrettable que ce soit, on ne peut pas faire valoir ces notions pour décrire et justifier un combat qui devrait, qui doit en principe bouleverser les fondements même de notre société. Il y a là une extrapolation. Non, je n'arrive pas à trouver la justification de ce qu'on a which I don't really think they can help me finish through either analytically or understand or whatever. But the same thing uh, John Jay had in the the people who own the country ought to govern it. Uh, and the people who own the country have uh, basically now are a network of uh, corporations and conglomerates and banks and so on. They ought to govern it. And the way they do it is what it is described. Now, as far as the Soviet Union is concerned, I didn't have any talk on this point, but I've written about this stuff. I have just made the charge. I've written about it and explained why I think it's true. And it doesn't bother me if I have to agree with this in mainstream media. Uh, but, uh, there's a dude like Trotsky, who is somebody uh, who is remembered. Uh, once he was charged in the 1930s uh, with agreeing with the fascists in his condemnation of the Soviet Union. And he pointed out that his critique was to be true. It was sort of abandoned. Somebody else has to say, to say it for different reasons. So the question is about the Soviet Union, and particularly about Lenin. So what was Lenin's plan? 
Well, in my view, here we have to look at the facts. Now, you know, you look at the facts, but I think that here you find uh, Lenin was a right-wing deviation of the socialist movement, and he was so regarded. He was regarded as that by the Marxists, by the mainstream Marxists. We've forgotten who the mainstream Marxists were because they lost, and you only remember the guys who won. But if you go back to, the, to that period, uh, the mainstream Marxists were people like, for example, Anton Tanaka, who was head of education for the, uh, uh, for the Marxist movement, and a serious, he's the one, one of the people who Lenin later denounced as an infantile leftist, uh, but he was one of the leading intellectuals of the actual Marxist movement. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg was another mainstream Marxist, and there were others. And they were very critical, in fact, Trotsky was one of them in 1970. Uh, they were all very critical of Lenin because of this, what they regarded as this opportunity, the vanguard was uh, the idea that the radical intelligentsia were going to exploit the popular movements to seize state power and then to use that state power to whip the population into the society that they chose. Now that was quite inconsistent with Marxism as, to, as understood by the mainstream sort of left Marxists. From this point of view, Bolshevism was a right wing deviation. Trotsky made the same point up until 1970s. Now, when Lenin came back to Russia, uh, in uh, April 1917, he but took a different line, quite a different line from the one he'd had in the past. If you take a look at Lenin's work, it shifted character in April 17. In April 1917, it became kind of libertarian. Uh, that's when he came out with the April Theses, and that's when he wrote Stake and Democracy. Came out, it came out a year later. That's when it was written. And these were because uh, the State and Revolution. These, these were basically libertarian works. Uh, they were very much more in the main in the mainstream uh, of sort of environmental control. Less a uh, libertarian uh, socialism uh, from sort of, you know, this range that goes from anarchism cheap. over to left Marxism, uh, that the kind of lo lo Luxembourg variety. You know, that that uh, and he talked about Soviets, the need for, you know, workers' organization and so on. And in fact, came really closer to what the essence of socialism was always understood to be. After all, the core of socialism was understood to be workers' control over production. That was the core. It's where you begin, then you go on to other things. But the beginning is control by the workers over production. Off the That's where it begins. China, uh, the factories and then Lenin took power in October 1917 uh, in what's uh, called a revolution, but in my view it ought to be called a coup. Uh, but it's all uh, and the, uh, to, uh, then the, the and things followed economy. that coup. Now, that's one of the reasons why you want to call it that. Trade uh, one of the things that followed it was the immediate move to destroy the Soviets and the factory council. Those were some of the first moves no, of Lenin and Trotsky after they took Trotsky joined at that point, uh, after they took state power. In fact, if you look at what Lenin wrote after that period, or did, you'll find it's a reversion of the early position. This sort of left deviation uh, is that, a deviation. You could ask why. In my view, it was just opportunistic. Uh, he knew that in order to gain power, he was going to have to go along with the popular currents that were developing which were, in so fact, have really spontaneous numbers, and libertarian and uh, that, so socialist, as most popular it. movements are, well, have been in fact, since the 17th century. And being an astute politician, which he was, he sort of went along with Mexico. that and talked the line that well, the certainly people wanted to hear. Just like when an American politician goes somewhere and his pollsters tell him, say so-and-so, and he says a lot, and he believes it. And I think Lenin was doing the same thing without polls. In any event, whatever the interpretation is, when he took power, he reverted to the former vanguardism uh, and moved at once to eliminate the organs of workers' control. Now that meant he was moving to destroy socialism. If socialism has as its core workers' control over production, uh, the Soviets and the factory councils were instruments of workers' control. And same, uh, you could say the defective instruments that worked out better and so on, yeah, no doubt. But they were the instruments that had been developed in the course of popular struggle for to implement basically workers' control, and those were the first things to go. By early 1918, this is now still really before the Civil War set in, Lenin's view was pretty clearly expressed. It was the view that uh, both he and Trotsky took the position that uh, what you need is what, what Trotsky called a labor army, which is submissive to the uh, control of a single leader. Because as modern 
uh, you know, progress and development and socialism requires that the mass of the population subordinate themselves to a single leader uh, in a disciplined workforce. Well, that has absolutely nothing to do with socialism. In fact, it's the exact opposite of it. Uh, and it uh, was criticized uh, for that by the, in a sense, in a spirit of some solidarity, because the, re you know, the revolutionary forces were still operative. It was criti he was criticized for that by people like Rosa Luxemburg and by uh, uh, Panikos and Gorder and the other mainstream sort of left Marxists, in, in an and, that's not, and I think they were right. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, and, and then it just goes on from there. I mean, Lenin reconstructed uh, the czarist systems of oppression, of often more efficiently. That's not the only question. KGB and there are other, uh, uh, other techniques of control example, and oppression. I think from that point on, there was nothing remotely like socialism in the Soviet Union. I think it was, in fact, uh, in my view, the precursor of later forms of totalitarianism. That all tend to equalize the conditions. Is that a utopian measure? Not at all. It's been used. You take a look at the European Union. Uh, before the European Union integrated, uh, efforts, substantial efforts were made and substantial costs were uh, assumed to raise the level of the poorer countries, Portugal, uh, Spain, and Greece, to raise labor standards, uh, to raise wages, improve conditions enough and get to the northern standards, but enough so that when they finally integrated, there wasn't a very severe blow against uh, the uh, wages and living standards of northern workers. Well, that's because they have a kind of social market economy and a more or less functioning democratic system. And the same could have been done with regard to NAFTA. In fact, it was proposed by the U.S. labor movement, but never entered the discussion. And the same, uh, because you know, corporate media are against it, and the elites are against it, uh, but uh, and the same could be true of the whole outsourcing story. So there are other options. It's not either let the command economies uh, maximize their own profit and power, uh, or else uh, you know, 